got a great one today, you know, for a change. Frank Four from the Atlantic Monthly for a report on the war in Ukraine. Actually, uh, this great one was supposed to be on last week, but we had a, a breaking news. Uh, in case you've forgotten, the Justice Department issued a 37-count indictment on former President Donald Trump. And it was my news judgment that we should hold Frank's brilliant podcast for a merely adequate one of me and Mark Leibovich uh, discussing the indictment. But wouldn't you know it, my judgment was slightly off because it turned out that the one with Mark was just fantastic. So two great ones in a row. That has happened before, uh, but we don't keep records here, so I, I, I can't remember. But before we uh, get to the uh, counteroffensive in Ukraine, a little bit more about the indictment of the former uh, um, president, Donald Trump. It all looked very, very bad for him, especially if you read the 37 counts. And then he got assigned Judge Ailing Cannon, a district judge in the Southern District of Florida, who had been the judge on the documents case before and had made a couple rulings that were overturned by the uh, very conservative 11th Circuit uh, Court of Appeals, which uh, really rebuked her. Uh, for being a terrible judge. And now she's the judge for Trump's trial on the documents, and she has tremendous power here. She can delay the thing until after the election if she wants, uh, which is very, very possible. So I have figured out the odds of uh, her being the next Supreme Court justice. It's not great. A few things would have to happen. She has to, uh, one, delay the trial till after the election. That's evidently pretty easy. Then Trump has to win the election, of course. I don't even want to put odds on, on that. It's just scary. Then Republicans would have to take back the Senate. Unfortunately, those odds are pretty good. Republicans have just 10 incumbents running, mostly are in pretty safe states. Uh, Ted Cruz is underwater in Texas. Colin Allred has a uh, shot there. But we have 23 Democratic senators running for re-election, including John Tester and Sherrod Brown and Joe Manchin, who are all considered vulnerable. But say Republicans get the Senate. Say, let's just say it's 50 50 with Vice President Kerry Lake casting the tie breaking uh, vote for control. And Trump is president. Then all Aileen Cannon needs is for Clarence Thomas to retire. And bang, Trump nominates Aileen Cannon. And all she needs are the 50 votes in the, from the senators and Vice President Kerry Lake casting the tie breaking vote. And boom. You've got Justice Aileen Cannon, and I'm putting the odds at uh, five to one against. But I don't know if uh, Aileen Cannon is thinking the same, the same way I am, but um, this is really her only shot, I think, at the Supreme Court. Okay, back to Ukraine. When I spoke with Frank, who, by the way, is amazing. Uh, this is Frank's fourth time on the podcast, uh, second time on Ukraine, and you know, I really got to rethink uh, my pantheon of guests. Uh, you know, I've said a number of times that Heather McGee is the best guest I've ever had, and she's amazing. She's been on three times. But then I started thinking about Dahlia Lithwick, who's been on, I don't know, like nine times. Again, we don't, we don't really keep track of things. So I started thinking, you know, maybe I have to rethink this and put together a pantheon of great guests with Heather, of course, and Dahlia and, and Frank. Uh, you'll agree after listening to this one, he, he'll belong there. And then, to a lesser extent, uh, Norm Ornstein. But this one with Frank, recorded about 10 days ago, is so sophisticated about intelligence and weapons and strategy that it's just a joy to listen to. The Ukraine counteroffensive has begun since we recorded this, and they've retaken some territory and small towns. But from what I've been reading... They are really kind of poking around, looking for the best strategy, and we don't know that much yet. As Frank says, it's very spy versus spy, you know, from the Mad Magazine days. And I know that you are just going to love, love, love this one, enjoy it, you know, for a change. 
Mike's been working on a book about uh, sort of the Biden administration, the first administration, right? First one. Well, there's only been one Biden administration so far, unless I've uh, got my premise of my book spectacularly wrong. <laughs> okay, you're right. You're right. Well, I say it'll be the, I was talking about winning the next election uh, because that's kind of important. You understood. Yeah, no, I understood where you were going with that. That's why you're our guest. Yeah. Because yeah. you're smart. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to talk Ukraine today. Let's, but the book, uh, what's the title? It's called The Last Politician, and it's uh, an inside account of the Biden presidency. It's coming out in September, just after Labor Day. Let's talk about uh, Ukraine. Uh, Kevin McCarthy doesn't want supplemental funding for Ukraine. And here's what he said about that. Uh, I think what we really need to do, we need to get efficiencies in the Pentagon. Think about it. $886 billion. You don't think there's waste? I consider myself a hawk, but I don't want to waste money. So I think we've got to find efficiencies. <laughs> you know what? No one's ever thought of that before. Never. You hear this from a lot of like congressional candidates for Congress, actually. I know how to cut the budget. Get rid of the waste. <laughs> Find efficiencies. No one's ever thought of that before. Now, we need an emergency supplemental, right, for Ukraine? Yes. I mean, the Ukrainians um, are stuck in this position where they're well-funded for the next phase of the war. But if it seems like the next phase is the only next phase of the war, if it's just going to be about this counteroffensive and then they won't have the munitions, the artillery to go further than that, then they're putting themselves in a terrible position, not just for prosecuting the war, but also uh, for diplomacy that might come after this counteroffensive. They need to be perceived as possessing the ability to press forward. If they look like they're just this unfunded, army that could continue to be crushed by Russia, there's no reason for Russia to want to come to the table. I mean, I'm not sure it's likely that Russia would want to come to the table, but if there's any prospect for diplomacy, Ukraine can't appear to be stranded by its benefactor. That's really interesting because I want to now quote Marjorie Taylor Greene, who wrote this <laughs> tweet. I will not, capital N-O-T, vote for any money to be appropriated to fund a war in Ukraine and voted no all along. The U.S. should end the war and bring peace, not fund death. So I think what you're saying is if any chance of peace, <laughs> you should probably fund, fund them so uh, Russia would maybe, after this offensive, come to the table. If if that's at all possible, exactly, or, or to get it to get a peace on on reasonable terms that actually preserve the Ukrainian state, that make it uh, so that Russia is uh, is penalized for its invasion. I think the the danger of any peace settlement that comes, and I'm sure Marjorie Taylor Greene's losing a lot of sleep over this, is that Russia would somehow win the war and keep all the territory that it captured in the course of invasion. And therefore, they would have very little reason not to go back for more. I mean, this is kind of what happened in 2014. So when Russia first invaded Ukraine, they grabbed territory. For Crimea. There was no price that they paid for their conquest. And so they come back for more. You know what? I should have gotten her on. and We could have had a debate on this. Uh, so let's talk about this offensive. Has it begun? Do we? They didn't announce this is when our offensive be begins, right? They don't announce it, and it's not even entirely clear, I think, to the U.S. government when uh, when the, the offensive begins, because there's a lot of poking and prodding last time. So the last time there was a, a Ukrainian counteroffensive, was, it began last September. And I remember when that happened, talking to people in the Pentagon, and there was a sense of antsiness that Ukraine seemed to be We'd given Ukraine all these weapons, and Ukraine was lobbing a lot of uh, missiles in the direction of Russian troops, but they weren't going 
through the major motions of a counteroffensive. And we were sitting around saying, come on, guys, let's get moving. And so even we didn't know. And there's two strategic things. One is Ukraine wants to keep everything under lock and key in order to preserve an element mm-hmm. um, of surprise. Um, and that's how they began the war, right? I mean, they, in other words, uh, from my reading that – they were really secretive totally before the invasion yeah i mean they really played this smart right well listen it's a country that emerged from the soviet union and so the the sense that you like the, the sense of mistrust that they would have of the russians and that the russians were surveilling them i mean there's a lot of understandable reasons why the ukrainians would be cagey about their maneuvers and especially about their battlefield maneuvers because what we saw in the last counteroffensive was that there was this hugely successful strategic feint where it looked like they were massing all their troops in the south to make a big push in the south. And so then Russia remobilizes its forces and moves its forces down to the south in order to check the Ukrainians. Meanwhile, the Ukrainians were using that as a little piece of misdirection, and they made this major push in the north that was extremely successful where they took back a big swath of the Kharkiv region in the north. And so the truth is, even though we have a good sense of what the Ukrainians' major objectives are in this counteroffensive, that they want to do something big to collapse the Russian occupation of the south, maybe cut off the land bridge connecting Crimea to Ukraine. Can they do that? Will they be able to do that? And if they do that, I mean, that would be a remarkable feat, I think. You no, know, it would be. I mean, I, I think that every chapter I think of this war from Ukraine's perspective has been fairly remarkable. But there's been a complicating factor that's happened. This dam has been blown up. And so a good chunk of the Dnipro River Basin has been flooded. I mean, this was a reservoir that was basically the size, the volume of the Great Salt Lake. It's just come rushing down to the south of Ukraine, creating all of this marshland, wiping out roads. So this river, the Dnipro River, had been the de facto front line for the for the battle. And so you had Russia amassed on one side of it, Ukraine amassed on the other side of it. There was a possibility that there would have been some sort of amphibious crossing in the course of the counteroffensive. That, that's no longer possible, I think, in the immediate terms. Ukraine... Uh, the Ukrainian state in general is now consumed with this humanitarian disaster that they're having to deal with. Um, Russia's fortifications on the other side of the river have been wiped out. The trenches, the the landmines, the various fortifications that they installed have been wiped away. So that's to Russia's disadvantage. But um, a lot of the roads that Ukraine might have used in the course of a counteroffensive have also been wiped away. And so you you develop this intricate set of battle plans for what a counteroffensive would look like. And all of that is dependent on a good picture of what the terrain is and where troops are located. And that's all been completely scrambled by this uh, this dam bursting. So we don't know who did this, but you, you think it's the Russians, <laughs> it sounds like? Yeah. So I mean, one needs to be humble about making pronouncements about this because we saw what happened with Nord Stream 2 getting blown up, which seems like the Ukrainians did that as part of um, a sabotage operation. But to me, without knowing anything and and waiting patiently to, to find the answer, it seems like Russia has far more to benefit from the dam exploding. Russia had was occupying the dam. Russia, according to the Ukrainians, had mined the dam. And it seems like it's very unlikely that a missile could have destroyed the dam, even though a Ukrainian missile had landed on top of it, I think, a couple months ago. Most experts seem to say that it was it was detonated from within. So it was it was an act of sabotage. It would have been very hard for the Ukrainians to have pulled that off, given the Russian presence on top of the dam. So to me, and it sounds like what Western intelligence is, is is where it's pointing right now. The, the, it's more likely that Russia did it than Ukraine. Is is this knowable? It's not. Doesn't sound like it's knowable. It, it, there's so much intelligence that uh, the U.S. collects about both Ukraine and Russia. I assume they'll know. So they'll go over the satellite footage and go. There's Igor. There's Igor going in there with the bomb. <laughs> 
Which Igor? The Ukrainian Igor? <laughs> I, 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 well, yeah, I, well, Igor will be I, Igor will be uh, uh, calling his cousin back in Moscow to brag about what he did, and we'll intercept that call. Oh, there you go. It'd be funny if that was it. <laughs> it would be funny. If we find it's... out that was it in you know two months or something, or a month, and and you called it, or the actually the two of us. <laughs> we'll have some bragging rights on the Al Franken podcast. Okay. Yeah. No, bookmark okay. this moment in the podcast. <laughs> so, uh this so this sounds like it changes all all the plans for uh the counteroffensive or maybe they were going up north and coming down. No. They 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 were going to go south. So we, no no it's we we really don't know what the, what the plans were. So in the course of working on my book, I did, I, I did, I collected a history of the way that the first offensive, counteroffensive was planned. And one thing that has happened over the course of the war is that you have this very mature relationship that has formed between the U.S. military and the Ukrainian military. And that we talked a moment ago about some of the distrust that was there, but it's become a much more trusting relationship. And the last Ukrainian counteroffensive was planned essentially at a base in Germany where the Ukrainians took their war plans and then war gamed it out with the United States and with the British and the British and the U S took the Ukrainian plans and they, they all did each, each country disappeared into a separate room and ran the plans through their simulators and then came back with a revised sense of what's possible and what's not possible. And it's really one of the, the important strengths of the Ukrainian military is that we do have this war planning capacity that we can give them. The second thing that's happened is that we've given them all this weaponry. And it takes a degree, not just of training to use the weaponry, um, to like actually hit the trigger and to, to aim the missiles, but there's uh, what's called doctrinal uh, sophistication you know, about how you integrate the arms in, in into the maneuvers of an army. So that was my minor in college, by the way. So. I know Harvard excels at that. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfortunate <laughs> moment. Go ahead. No, no, no. Nothing is too important to uh, be delayed by a joke. So the so the Ukrainians need to be able, Ukrainians. I think have gotten better at over time at integrating the technologies and the weaponry that they have with the movements of troops. That's the special sauce. But then because- then we began this by saying that the US probably doesn't know what they're planning, but it sounds like No, no, we 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 know we know what the plans are probably in pretty great detail, but we don't know when they're going to uncork them. Okay, talking about the weaponry that that they do have, uh you know, a, a certain number of uh Republicans, notably Lindsey Graham, has been critical of the pace at which uh, the president has given the Ukrainians the weapons that they've been requesting, more and more sophisticated weapons. And I reminded him that, you know, that we were a little worried about Putin using tactical uh, nuclear weapons, and that was a real threat. I mean, that was a threat we had to take seriously. Yeah. I mean, uh, the director of the CIA, Bill Burns, has been warning about this for a long time. Uh, Last fall, uh, we had to pretty sternly warn the Russians that uh, there'd be an incredible price for them to pay if they actually used tactical nuclear weapons in the course of battle. We've had to just feel our way through this conflict. We don't know exactly what will trigger Russian escalation. And Russia could escalate in all sorts of other ways that aren't that don't just involve tactical nukes. They can inflict the sort of damage that they might have inflicted the other day with destroying this dam, that they can kill civilians with even greater impunity than they've been doing it. They can press the conflict closer to the uh, border with with NATO, raising the possibilities that the conflict may spin out of control. There are all sorts of things that they could do. And so what the Biden administration has done, I think quite prudently, is to continually 
press the envelope to test the Russians to see what they'll respond to. And when it's clear that the Russians won't escalate in response to us giving Ukrainians whatever tranche of weapons we give them, they then take advantage of that and give them even more sophisticated, even better weapons. And so we're now at the stage where the Ukrainians are going to have a fleet of F-16s in the not so distant future. And that'll be a really important thing for them on the battlefield. And so I mean, Graham, Graham is correct that there are various moments where Ukrainians were asking us for more. And um, Biden decided that he wasn't going to give them what they were asking for. And escalation was definitely on Biden's brain when he refrained from doing that. But the Pentagon also has a strong point of view about the best way to give Ukraine arms that, as I was describing just a few minutes before, that we want to give them arms that can be integrated quickly into their practices, that they have the doctrinal sophistication to be able to deploy uh, effectively and efficiently. I mean, it's it's not it's not worth it to give them weapon systems and to train them up on weapon systems that they aren't going to be able to effectively use. And so there is a little bit of uh, big bro- brother paternalism in our relationship with the Ukrainian military, where Ukraine is under threat. They want everything that they can possibly get, but our military wants to elevate their game so that they use the weapons that we give them in a way that helps them win the war. That's a, that's a, um, an interesting tension. And, uh, one that well, you seem like an apologist for Biden, for the U S <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I mean, so being paternalistic when they're the ones, <laughs> you know, getting, uh, killed, but, um, well, let's say when you're when you're in the foxhole and you're under pressure, you want anything, right? You you're not you're not necessarily thinking in a rational sort of way, and it's it's a lot of times Zelensky is making pleas for these things because he sees that there's a political opening to make them, um, and he's doing what any leader in his position would do, and there's a temptation to cave every time he asks for these things because. It's politically expedient, but there's also the battlefield reality, and um, it does make sense to me to have Pentagon military planners who are the best in the world um, having some say in what we give them. If that makes me an apologist, then God damn it, Al, call me an apologist. You're an apologist. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, uh, I. Uh, this is helping our understanding, which is kind of the purpose of the podcast. So this is like three-dimensional uh, chess, except maybe even more complicated, four-dimensional chess, which I don't know what that, I don't even know what three-dimensional chess, but four, oh, yes, I do. It's three-dimensional chess, but four-dimensional chess would incorporate time. There's no time machine. Well, next time we'll get together, we'll try it in eight dimensions and see how that goes. Whoa! Wow! <laughs> oh, man. God. I got to stop doing psilocybin for these. Maybe uh, after you go to one of those Grateful Dead shows. By the way, they were great in Ithaca. Um, so, so this could have delayed this offensive, the counter. When, when do you call it a counteroffensive? When is it a counter, counter, counteroffensive? This is, they're just all become counteroffensives. I didn't know I was going on an epistemology podcast, Al. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, let's just go. Let's just go basic uh, war podcast. So uh, this could delay the counteroffensive. I think that there were signs that a counteroffensive of some sort had begun, and, and not in the region that we were talking about, because the action for the last since um, the last six months or longer of the war has been in the city of Bakhmut, where um, I think one of the very interesting dynamics in the war is that Putin has been very, very reluctant to order another mobilization of his population. He he really, he doesn't want to get stuck calling up more troops. And so he started to outsource the fighting of the war to paramilitaries. So you see the development of these warlords. And Evgeny Prigozhin and the Wagner group have been the primary warlord that he's relied on. And uh, Prigozhin fought this major stand in Bakhmut, 
really for the purpose only of um, obtaining a victory that they could declare. What a costly victory for if it is a victory. I mean, they did take it, but is it being taken back? Yeah, it seems like it's a pretty flimsy uh, victory. And I guess in the last week, there's some evidence that the Ukrainians have started to take back some of the land around Bakhmut. And it was just, it's such a morally despicable victory, um, not only because there was no strategic reason for them to focus there, but it was also that they were throwing chum at the front line. They were taking all of these convicts and just who, who weren't very well trained and hurling them into battle where they'd get mowed down. And so that just meant the loss of life was even more horrendous than it, than it would have been under other circumstances. So it's, it's, a, it's like a really morally despicable chapter in among many morally despicable chapters. Yeah. It, it's, it's hard to conceive of that. If these, these prisoners who in some cases felt they might die in prison, not so long, it, you know, because they were sick or something like that or can't get treatment. We're given like, okay, we need you for six months. We'll give you, you know, and then you're free. And then they're just mowed down. One really interesting subtext to all of this is that Prigozhin has been accusing the Russian military of betrayal throughout this whole process. He accuses them of competence. And then in the aftermath of the Battle of Bakhmut, you have actual kind of fire being exchanged between Wagner forces and Russian forces and prisoners being taken and um, a lot of, uh, it's really interesting and potentially very dangerous for Putin over the long run to have semi-autonomous warlords who, um, who, are, who are willing to, uh, to, to fight with Russian regulars. Putin's reluctance to engage in a mass mobilization it's it's maybe one of the few things that could make one hopeful about the outcome of this war because at a certain point Putin really is, has no choice but to call up more civilians. We'll talk about what's happening in Russia in terms of, I mean, he's cracked down on Russians, and you pay a real price for protesting, and it's become the kind of totalitarian state that we've thought of in the Soviet Union. What are those tensions? What, what's, what's going on there? Well, the tension is, is that when Putin declared war on Ukraine, he didn't actually call it a war. He called it a special military operation. And even though the country's gone on war footing, and even though it's been subjected to all of these sanctions, he's done his best to let Russian society try to churn on as if nothing had happened. And so you have all these Western countries pull out and then they get replaced by ersatz Russian versions of uh, what was left. Uh, so you, you know, instead of a Starbucks, it's just Star Coffee <laughs> that gets installed and, um, and, and life goes on. And one of the major things that would prevent from life from going on is if he uh, keeps going back and taking... Uh, fathers and brothers and grandfathers out of their jobs, out of their homes, and sends them to the front where uh, invariably many of them will die. And so he's just been very reluctant to do that. And even though he's done this once and called up 300,000 men, that did come at a cost for him. There was some degree of upset, not quite civil unrest, but but upset. Um, and I think he was genuinely worried about where that might go. And that stopped him from returning to that. And so, yeah, repression is one of the primary tools that he has. Propaganda is the other. And as things have gone from bad to worse for him, those are things that he's had to rely on even more in order to maintain things as they, as they exist. So is there any real understanding of what's going on in his mind. I mean, this was a horrible mistake he made, a miscalculation. When I've talked to people in the intelligence community or at the White House, I think that they feel like Putin's psychology is kind of a blind spot for them, that his inner circle has really collapsed. What does that mean, that his inner circle has collapsed? Well, so he, you know, if you go back to the beginning of his uh, time in power, 
he had a more robust inner circle. He had a lot of people around him. There was actually some vigorous debate in his inner circle. You had factions. You had people who were who were willing to um, to argue with him. And over time, like in the way that paranoid leaders become more paranoid over time, they they stop surrounding themselves with as many toadies. The toadies who were closest to them disagree with them less. And so, and I, and I think during the COVID, when Putin, who's a legendary hypochondriac, was kind of off by himself, it became harder to find people who were willing to put pressure on his ideas. And he just became much more more isolated. And so whatever he was thinking became became policy because there was there was there was nobody around him to to really push back ever. And and we don't have the we don't we just don't have, I think, a great sense of what his strategy is um, because it's not something that he's robustly talking about with others. We have such a molecular understanding of the Russian military. We probably have great intelligence on a lot of people inside the Kremlin. But then when you get to the absolute top, we just don't have a brilliant window into Putin's brain right now. That would be helpful. <laughs> yeah. um, it would be. <laughs> now, now, you say they started an offensive not uh, in the South. Is that correct? It's hard to know because there are battles that are happening all the time. And I think it's just hard to know what's actually in, in, in what, what might be a faint, what might be part of uh, an actual offensive it it's it's hard to know and and the ukrainians haven't been very clear about this and when you listen to john kirby who's the spokesperson who comments on this he's kept things close to his vest and so we're left guessing okay getting back to where we were at the just right at the beginning of this which is mccarthy talking about no supplemental and in the senate you have mcconnell is for it and 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 schumer released something together saying that there's nothing in the uh, uh, agreement between Biden and McCarthy that um, would be abrogated by a supplemental. The, what do you see in, in Congress in terms of support for the war, and especially in the House? Right. So I think in the White House, McConnell is probably regarded, regarded as a quiet hero of the war because he's just kept packages moving. But when McCarthy took on the gavel, the war then became beholden to McCarthy's precarious position. So when the Ukrainians would come to town to talk to McCarthy, I think they felt pretty good about McCarthy and where his heart is as relates to the, to the conflict. But the truth is that he's just cut this deal with Biden over the debt ceiling, and he's he's stamping down a revolt on his on his far right and. There just isn't a constituency among the House Republicans. There's there's fracture, and it's not clear that that most of them want to keep funding the war. I think most of them are pretty indifferent to it. And then you've got a small minority in the Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates types who have genuine American first, you know, uh, pro Putin positions, and they don't want to fund the war and. If they decide that they're going to stake out a hard line on this, it makes McCarthy's life really difficult. And just given the precariousness of his hold on his job, um, and given his lack of lack of courage, his hands are probably tied here. That if he pushed forward hard with giving the Ukrainians the supplemental, then he'd face a coup. It's interesting that he didn't face a coup on this debt ceiling. Even though, what they shut down the house for a few hours or something, the far right. But remember, part of the deal of him getting the speakership was that only it would take only one member to call a new vote on the speaker, and that just didn't happen. So, is it possibly stronger than he knows? Or yeah, no, he might be. He might be. But I think he probably also expended a lot of his capital on that vote, mm -hmm. and so he's reluctant to do so again. So he may be stronger than he thinks, and he may be able to, to to push forward with something like this without losing his job. But uh, it would it would take some courage or some tactical skills that maybe maybe he has that we don't 
didn't see <laughs> until this debt ceiling. And we need the house to fund things, right? <laughs> yes. And the Ukrainians desperately need the house to fund things. Where do you think this is going? I mean, <laughs> if they do a counteroffensive and if it's successful and is it possible and we continue, we, we show that we're, we're going to keep funding them uh, and, and the rest of our allies do, is there any chance of a settlement, a negotiated settlement that doesn't give Russia any territory? Right. So, of course, that would have to be a very successful counteroffensive, which is plausible. But, but, you, but as you said earlier, you can't, you can't reward them and rewarding them. You know, Zelensky says they, they want Crimea back. That's not going to be negotiated That's on, unless they just, in this counteroffensive, march all the way to, to Russia or something. There, there are a couple, the couple of big problems that you, the Ukrainians face. One is that Russia is just a much bigger country. Um, and even if Russia suffered heavier casualties in this war than Ukraine, Ukraine is going to get to a point where its, its best trained soldiers are going to be f- fewer and farther between because and that's already the case and so there's there's a certain point at which this war will just really begin to tax uh ukraine's capacity to fight so that's one problem the other problem is is that there's very little reason for ukraine this cuts in a different direction very little reason for ukraine to actually trust the russians when the russians agree to some sort of peace just given how russia sprung this invasion on them after settling the conflict or you know, entering into a peace process to try to end the conflict in 2014. And Russia's strategy, I think, as most people read it, is to just try to wait Ukraine out. They they just assume that at a certain point, Kevin McCarthy is going to be forced into this place where he's not going to be able to keep funding the, the initiative. And so Ukraine is just not going to have the artillery and munitions to be able to continue prosecuting the war. So Ukraine's going to want to cut a deal that's favorable to the Russians. And most wars are ended um, in their first year. And when they're not, they become protracted, frozen conflicts that extend over long periods of time. And there are a lot of people who speculate that we could be headed for some sort of Korean type of situation where there really is no peace and you just have uh, you have a frozen frozen conflict that ebbs and flows that that flares for moments and then settles down but you don't have any sort of real permanent peace between the two sides and Ukraine's forced to exist in a state of almost permanent mobilization in order to fend off the prospect that Russia is going to attack them by surprise at any given moment and make a much bigger push. It's hard to be optimistic about where things go, even even with a a successful counteroffensive, simply because Ukraine's support in the United States is going to it's going to fade at some point. And it seems like we may be hitting up against that moment relatively soon. Is Trump talked? About this, I mean, has has Trump staked out for what it's worth <laughs> um, a position on that? You know, I, I haven't I haven't heard him talk about this for some time. But That's right. It's it seems pretty clear where his allegiances <laughs> lie and what he cares about. I mean, I think the Marjorie Taylor Greens are, are pretty much proxies for what Trump actually believes and he'll be the nominee it looks like for the moment unless how many indictments would it take you think and and convictions (laughs) would it take for him not to be the nominee infinity (laughs) (laughs) okay all right well on that optimistic note all right thank you al oh man thank you well i i hope you enjoyed uh listening that beautiful music is by leo kotke the great leo kotke I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. Mm